Hello and welcome back. Let's take a further look into the movement phase, gunnery phase and the end phase. The ability to maneuver a ship into a position of advantage is vital. By outwitting your opponent, you will keep your ships in optimum range for their weaponry while keeping them out of the fire arcs of your opponent's most dangerous guns. Once it has been determined who will move first, i.e. the player who has lost the initiative phase, players take turns in moving their ships. A ship may only move once per turn and all ships must move to be nominated, even if it means your ship unfortunately ends up in your opponent's sights. You are not allowed to skip or ignore a ship during the movement phase. When nominated, a ship may move a distance in inches up to its flank speed score indicated on its ship card. However, unless the ship has a flank speed reduced to zero due to damage, it must always move a minimum of one inch forward. A ship can change the direction of its movement only after it has moved at least two inches forward in a straight line. It can then make a turn of 45 degrees to either left or right. The turning gauge included in the starter set helps you facilitate these moves. A ship may turn any number of times in its movement so long as it has moved two inches forward in a straight line before each turn. If the ship, for whatever reason, cannot move the required two inches, then it cannot turn and must remain facing forward at the end of its move. Ship models may never be stacked on top of each other, so you may never end your movement phase on top of another ship. If your ship's movement ends itself in the same position as another ship, then simply move it wholly to one side of the stationary vessel, whichever side the moving ship's bridge would have ended up on. These are the basic movements you will need to know to play victory at sea. However, there are a range of orders you can attempt to perform during this phase instead of just moving normally. From scrabbling fighters on an aircraft carrier to taking evasive action when under attack, or simply laying smoke to hinder the efforts of the enemy guns. These are mentioned in more detail within the Victory at Sea rulebook. Now that all the ships have moved on the table, it is time to unleash their raw firepower and reduce the enemy's vessels to ruin and scrap metal. From torpedoes of fast attack boats to the immensely powerful main guns found on the largest of battleships to sail the oceans, there are a variety of ways to destroy your enemy. Starting with the player who won the initiative phase, players alternate the firing with each of their ships. Rolling to hit, calculate damage, and resolving any critical effects before moving on to the next attacking ship. This of course can make winning the initiative phase very crucial in some terms. Once a ship has been nominated to fire, the player follows the process 1. Nominate targets for every weapon system that will fire this phase. 2. Check fire arc and range for each weapon system. 3. Resolve firing. 4. Resolve damage. For an attack to be successful, two conditions must first be met. Firstly, the target must lie within the fire arc of the weapon system that is firing. Secondly, the target must be within range of that fire arc. You must nominate a visible target for every weapon system you wish to fire from your ship at the same time before any attacks are made. As the ship models are only representational, they do not block line of sight. Always measure from the bridge of your ship to the bridge of your target when checking for both range and if the target lies within the appropriate fire arc or not. Unless your ship has certain rules, you may fire each weapon system and fire at multiple targets. Further rules for splitting fire and torpedoes are covered in the rulebook. 
Please take note, the weapon system's fire arcs are noted on the ship card. Let's go back to our Northampton-class heavy cruiser. Its turret A and turret B main guns have a fire arc that covers the fore, port and starboard arcs, aka the front, left and right sides, while the AA battery can use all positions of fore, aft, port and starboard, giving it a 360 degree arc of fire. For simplicity's sake, we will only be firing the turret A main guns. As it is within short range to use this weapon system, there is no modifier applied to the dice. Turret A has three attack dice, which means you will roll three d6 dice. For every result on a four or more, the weapon has hit. Had he been at point-blank range, all results would have been culminated into a hit for each dice as you would receive a plus one modifier. At long range, you would receive a minus one modifier and extreme range a minus two. Damage. Once hits have been scored on a target, it is time to see what damage has been caused. Every system has a damage dice score. For turret A, it has a damage dice score of one. This is the number of d6 rolled for every attack dice that is successfully hit its target. The weapon system's armor piercing score is then added to or subtracted from each damage roll. Turret A's main guns do not have an armor piercing value, so nothing is added or subtracted from the damage dice result. The resulting number on each damage dice is then compared to the target's armor value. For every damage dice that equals or exceeds the armor score, one point of damage is deducted from the target's hull. To show this, simply move the damage sliders on the ship card. Note that each damage dice that rolls a natural one automatically deflects off the target and causes no damage, regardless of the weapon system's armor piercing value. Each damage dice that rolls a natural six, however, has the potential to also cause a critical hit. For every natural six rolled, roll that d6 again, even if it caused no damage to the target ship due to the ship's armor. If on this roll you get a result of a four or more, then in addition to causing any damage as normal, you will also score a critical hit. For every critical hit, roll a d10 and consult the critical area table to determine where the ship has been affected. Keep track of critical hits with critical hit tokens. If a ship's hull is reduced to zero, it is considered to be destroyed and sinks. Remove the model from the board. Once all the players have moved and attacked with all their ships, the end phase finalizes the turn. This phase is used to complete any actions needed for special rules, as well as providing a vital chance for players to repair any damage their ships have sustained from critical hits. You should go through the following procedures in order during every end phase. These are damage control and checking for escalation. Warships train and maintain specialist groups of crews collectively known as damage control. It is their job to assess and report damage sustained, stop it from getting worse, and where possible, effect repairs. During the end phase, each ship can use their damage control to attempt to repair damage sustained to a critical area. The player who won the initiative phase this turn attempts this for all their ships first followed by all other player ships. Each ship may only attempt one damage control repair a turn. Some critical area penalties indicate the critical score may suffer escalation. All critical areas subject to the escalation penalty must roll to determine whether or not the damage to the ship increases. Remember to keep rolling for escalation every end phase until and unless the critical score drops below the point that the escalation appears. Thank you for keeping your sights on Victory at Sea, and we hope you join us in this nautical adventure. 
The rule book will feature many nuances and additional rules, such as national characteristics and traits for particular ships, adding more flavor and dynamics to your games.